as, as, as those of you who have been to others of these lectures will know, the aim of this course of lectures this year, um, this academic year, has been to look at the relationship between uh, values and uh, markets in the context of a broader sort of inquiry which will cover the three years of my tenure of this Gresham professorship, uh, which uh, looks at the relationship between uh, religion and liberal society. But of course, a free market economy is usually taken to be an essential concomitant of a liberal um, society, and that, that's where we started uh, this year, to try to look at some of the moral uh, uh, issues raised by uh, market economics and to see as clearly as we can um, precisely where these value issues arise and what might be done to address them. Uh, so in the first lecture, which was a rather general one, I tried to outline um, some of the issues which I then looked at in some detail in previous lectures, the role of choice, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the role of justice and social justice, uh, the role of property and whether property um, carried with it certain kinds of obligations and if so, what would the source of those obligations be or are, are they just sort of self-chosen, self-assumed and so on. Uh, and, and today I want to look at uh, the role of uh, trust in markets and this has become uh, quite an important uh, and, and much written about uh, topic um, in, in recent years. Um, just to take one example of how important it is, the uh, report on the manipulation of the LIBOR rate uh, made it pretty clear that absolutely essential uh, to what happened was a failure of trust and that uh, it was imperative uh, that uh, something like that has to be addressed and we have to know how to try to rebuild trust in relationships and uh, situations where it has been eroded and that's, uh, that was a, a central feature of the uh, weekly uh, report on, on LIBOR. Uh, but it's a much broader issue than just that. Um, uh, because in a sense it, it, it's at the far technical end, as it were, of market-based issues. But there are, in a sense, the issue of trust in markets is, is quite pervasive. Um, it ranges from having trust and confidence in uh, the currency. Uh, once a currency is uh, separated off from some kind of necessary link to a physical thing like gold or whatever, uh, it depends entirely upon confidence and trust to have value. Um, and trust is crucial to the making of contracts. Uh, as the great French sociologist Emile Durkheim once famously uh, remarked, uh, not everything in the contract is contractual. Meaning by that, that you, you can, you know, understand a contract, you can sign a contract, you can agree a contract at the end of a negotiation and so forth, but nevertheless, the whole sort of relationship, the whole contractual relationship presupposes a whole set of values, including trust, including truth-telling, including promise-keeping. These are not recited in the contract, but the contract rests crucially upon them, and that without, um, without a kind of backup of these values, then contracts would be regarded as a sort of uh, uh, breakable at will if you were pursuing your own self-interest. Um, and uh, Durkheim is very strong on this kind of idea that contracts have to rely upon some pre-contractual or non-contractual uh, relationships in order for contracts to work, and without contracts to work, you couldn't really have a capitalist economy because it's so crucially based on those. Even non-formal contracts like, you know, if you give me a pound, I'll give you this newspaper, 
Uh, it's not a contract, but it is a relationship that's based on trust. If I, if I, if I want a copy of the Times and I give you a pound and you're a news agent, I assume and trust that you will give me a copy of the Times in exchange for my pound. But that it all presupposes this accumulated culture, if you like, of promise keeping, of truth telling, and so on. But the difficulty is with this, um, which will form one of the themes of the talk today, the difficulty with this, is that uh, it's been a feature of writing about capitalism since its inception, really, uh, that in a market, uh, individuals pursue what they take to be their self-interest. I mean, they might be wrong or mistaken about what is in their interest. You can always miscalculate, you can always do something that you expect to be in your interest and it turns out not to be. But the idea is that the motivation in a market is essentially that of utility maximization or the pursuit of self-interest. So if the moral um, framework, if you like, of a market and action within a market are based upon self-interest, how do we understand the kind of uh, confidence that we can have in this background framework of agreed values and so forth on which something like contract depends. If I am motivated entirely by utility maximization, if I'm entirely motivated by the pursuit of my self-interest, why should I, if I can get away with it, uh, pay any attention to these background uh, values. After all, value is entirely subjective on this view. It's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and the, the fundamental driver of human life is self-interest. So how do we connect up the pursuit of self-interest with these sort of social values which seem to be essential uh, for the capitalist order? There's a bit of a disjunction between accepting the idea that there are a set of settled values on which capitalism has to rest, while at the same time assuming that within the capitalist economy people will act quite rightly out of self-interest and utility maximisation. So, so there's an issue there about how we reconcile uh, these two things. And the issue is um, more complex than that, uh, even, because it's, it's not just about contracts. I've emphasised contracts so far, but it's about even the nature of the goods that you're buying in a market. Economists distinguish between inspection goods and credence goods. An inspection good is something like an avocado pear or a melon or something like that where I can pick it up, I can inspect it, I can use my experience and my judgment to figure out whether this avocado is ripe or not and whether I want to buy it in those circumstances. But a credence good is a good that depends upon uh, the, uh, the beliefs that you have about the good which you can't necessarily verify. So, for example, uh, if you buy an avocado in some shops, they are um, uh, set in a plastic container with a pretty rigid, transparent plastic top, and it says, ripe to eat. Uh, but you can't figure that out for yourself. You've got to assume that the supermarket is telling the truth when it says that this, this avocado pear is ripe, and quite frequently they're not in my experience. But the the, the point is that many, many goods are credence goods. They go way beyond inspection goods. And in order for us to have confidence to purchase credence goods, we have to make strong assumptions about trust, about truth-telling, and, and, and so forth. Otherwise, uh, we won't get very far. And with credence goods goes a, a set of other things as well that are unfortunately, in the news just at the moment, in that many goods end up for sale in an economy like the United Kingdom's uh, as the result of extremely long uh, and complex supply chains, which usually the purchaser has no information about, 
or is disinclined to enquire and so forth. So you can have goods that are being uh, created in uh, unsafe factories, as with the uh, Bangladesh sort of uh, catastrophe. Uh, but a credence good is one that you've got to accept on trust. I mean, that's really what it means. So if credence goods depend on trust, how are we to understand the foundations of trust and how are we to understand the relationship between trust and the pursuit of rational uh, self-interest? And it applies also, not just as it were across an economy, but in very specific kinds of examples. One of the uh, things that has been going on since the financial crisis is the idea that the power of shareholders um, in companies and particularly uh, companies that um, uh, trade in financial products, that the power of shareholders should be increased so that they can challenge what the company or firm is doing. But in doing that, you have to assume that the information that is provided by the traders to the managers in the firm and then by the managers to the board and then by the board to the shareholders, all of that is um, a credence good in a sense. And how are we to have trust in those processes um, that, 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 that would, will enable shareholders to make a rational judgment about whether what's being done in their name, in their company, uh, is the right thing? And it seems pretty clear from, uh, certainly um, in, in Parliament, uh, where I've sort of followed this uh, more than in the, uh, in the financial press, but in evidence to Parliament, it seems pretty clear uh, that many um, people working in the finance industry, particularly at the kind of managerial level, uh, had uh, some... Uh, well, they didn't have, in, in many cases, a complete understanding of the derivative products that were being sold. And if that's so, then again, the complexity of a good, and again, a credence good, the complexity of that good can militate against uh, trust. So, assume, let, let's assume that there is an issue, I won't say a problem at the moment, let's say there's an issue about the role of trust in um, a, a market uh, economy. Um, and if we see a market economy as responding to the idea that what's important about an individual is the capacity for choice, this goes back to the second lecture, I think it was, or perhaps the first lecture, is the capacity for choice, then there's quite an incentive to say, well, more and more of the, the goods that we rely on in society should be provided through markets because markets respond to choice and choice is what matters to individuals more than uh, anything else. Um, and I want to question really uh, whether that's true by looking at one strand of thinking about, about trust. Because what we face here is what... Um, uh, a French Prime Minister said, uh, I suppose in about 1997, something like that, Lionel, Lionel Jospin said uh, in a lecture in London uh, that one of the fundamental questions that Western societies will have to answer over the next uh, few years, over the next generation, is really whether they want, as they clearly do, a market economy, but do they really want a market society? meaning by that that markets should be extended to as many areas of our lives as it's feasible to do so. The justification for doing that would be about extending choice, extending independence, as it were, and arguments about efficiency. Um, but if, we, if there is a problem about trust in markets, and more and more areas of society are turned over to market relationships, then that trust issue will spill over into those uh, new areas where markets are being extended. And also, 
uh, and I mean, it's something I'm going to come back to in a minute. Also, if it is true that uh, a free market rests upon as its driver the rational pursuit of self-interest, then the extension of markets to more and more areas of society will inevitably mean that there is uh, sway being given to the rational pursuit of self-interest in more and more areas of society. So the issue that Jospin, as Jospin put it, was do we, we, we clearly want a market economy, but do we want a market society with everything that goes with that, uh, uh, both for good and for ill. Now, th there's quite a literature about how um, about how to deal with the issue of trust, and I'll just outline it in general terms for a moment, and then look, look at each of the, the, the. There are two major strands to this. I'll out, outline each strand very quickly, and then go into some detail about them. One strand is that capitalism rests upon a kind of moral order that it has inherited. But the process of capitalism itself undermines that moral heritage on which it has rested. Uh, and that if we are to deal with issues about morality and markets, and in particular trust and markets, then we have to somehow bolster up that heritage, that moral heritage, largely from the Judeo-Christian tradition, we have to bolster that moral heritage as a kind of counterbalance to the pursuit of self-interest in markets, so that we, are, we have an area of our common life together which emphasises values other than the pursuit of self-interest and the pursuit of utility and so on. And I'll just quote here from uh, an excellent book by uh, Francis Fukuyama, who first burst onto the stage, I suppose, about 20 years ago now, uh, with his book about the end of history. Uh, but a more recent book um, is one called um, Trust, the Social Virtues and the Creation of uh, prosperity. And this is what Fukuyama says. If the institutions of democracy and capitalism are to work, they must coexist with certain pre-modern cultural habits that ensure their proper functioning. Law, contract and economic rationality provide a necessary but not a sufficient basis for the prosperity of post-industrial societies. They must be leavened with reciprocity, moral obligation, duty towards community, and trust, which are based on habit rather than rational calculation. Now, um, if that's so, how do we somehow, as I said earlier, bolster in society the role of ideas like moral obligation, reciprocity, and community, and trust, which, so the argument goes, historically, market e economies have eroded. And this is an argument that's made both by critics of markets and supporters of markets. So, for example, um, Karl Polyani, uh, the um, historian, um, uh, flourished in the 1930s and 40s, I suppose, uh, in a book called The Great Transformation, argued this kind of case, that, that, we, that, that, that capitalism undermines precisely the moral framework on which it depends, and we've got to consider how to sustain that moral framework and keep it going. And Felix uh, Schumpeter in Capitalism, Socialism, and sorry, J Joseph Schumpeter in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy argues the same kind of thing: that capitalism is marked by what he calls creative destruction. But among the things that capitalism destroys is a, a kind of traditional moral order. And to just sort of even up the 
uh, the, the, I mean, both Polanyi and Schumpeter are supporters of markets. Karl Marx, as you will know, wasn't. And in uh, the Communist Manifesto, he and Engels wrote that in, in, in a capitalist economy, everything solid melts into air because of this kind of creative destruction. Uh, the, the kind of unpredictable consequences of individual choice um, and uh, the effect that that has on traditional values, traditional morality, traditional ways of life, or what Fukuyama calls habits. And of course, it, it's also true on this view that um, capitalism and industrialization, the two things very much go together, have led to enormous social changes which have an effect upon things like social values. Uh, that in a pre-industrial England, let's say, people lived in smaller communities, in villages and so forth, and there were quite strong um, constraints on what people could and couldn't do. There were quite strong constraints on um, the, the range of the, the, the choices that they could make. And yet, we've, uh, uh, what, uh, one of the consequences of that, one of the better consequences of that, you might think living like that would be intolerable, but one of the consequences of it that was a good consequence was that, in fact, in face-to-face -face relationships, as would be the case in villages and so forth, people could trust one another more uh, because they were in everyday interaction and you couldn't really get out of it. There was no way of sustaining a life for most people away from the community of which you were a part. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's all been changed in a fundamental way by industrialization and industrial capitalism. And in the early 19th century, Jeremy Bentham, who, the utilitarian philosopher, who was the one who really pushed the idea that morality is about, at the end of the day, self-interested calculation, um, he argued uh, it, that the problem of modern society is anonymity. Um, we, are, we are anonymous to one another. And he says, and this is a quotation, uh, that the main problem for modern society is, quote, who are you and with whom do I deal? Now, in a traditional society, small-scale traditional society, trust was not a particular problem because there were face-to-face -face relationships and quite strong social sanctions against betraying trust. But if we are now a society of anonymous individuals, so that the question, who are you and with whom do I deal, looms large, then we've got to have some way of thinking about relationships in the context in which these pre-modern arrangements have fallen away and what role can trust play when we're no longer remotely in that kind of uh, society. Now, the alternative view, I said there were two, two views here, the alternative view um, is that it doesn't really matter that this trust and so forth has been eroded uh, because you can replace trust, and you know, my word is my bond kind of uh, relationships as, as would happen in, in small-scale small kinds of relationships, you can replace trust by regulation, by law and regulation, and that, that what we need to do is to ensure that we are regulating relationships like contracts and so forth effectively through the law and other sorts of regulatory um, uh, arrangements. Um, and uh, they will, that those who take this view um, argue that what, what we need is sort of clever regulation that will recognize and accommodate and deal with the fact that people will always predominantly act in a self-interested way. We shouldn't give in to illusions about human behavior 
um, that, that somehow there are areas of our lives or areas of other people's lives where self-interest isn't the dominant thing. Self-interest is the dominant motivation and we need regulation that will provide a kind of normative framework for people to operate but not in a way that challenges their motivation, but just in a way that uh, recognises the fact that we are all uh, self-interested uh, creatures. Um, and this also means that if you are to operate in this way and, and that self-interest is a major driver of um, modern life, uh, then it's, it's vitally important on this view that people should take responsibility for how they pursue their own self-interest. And if they pursue it well, they should enjoy largely the results of their self-interested labours, but if they do it badly, they should bear the cost of it. They shouldn't try to offload the responsibility for uh, the malfunctioning of self-interest, they shouldn't try to offload the costs of that onto the uh, rest of us. But lying behind this is a, a difficult sort of idea or difficult notion to really uh, make tangible, but I think it is an important one. Um, that is to say that legal and regulatory frameworks um, can't just exist in a vacuum, uh, that those legal and regulatory frameworks themselves have to be supported by uh, an, a kind of normative framework, a, a framework of morality. Because after all, I mean, if you're, if you're going to pass laws about regulating markets or regulating behaviour and so forth, you've got to have some idea of, well, what ought we to be doing? How ought we to be dealing with this problem? And that's, if you like, a moral uh, question. You can't just appeal to law and regulation as a way of um, sidestepping moral and normative questions because they will come up again as part of the underpinning of regulation. So if you have uh, anti-monopoly law, you've got to be able to explain to someone who thinks they've got a good product and should seek to dominate the market with it, you know, what's wrong with that? And that's, that, in order to justify the law, you've got to have some kind of moral argument uh, about what's wrong with this way of doing something compared with that way of doing something. Otherwise, the idea of regulation doesn't uh, make a lot of sense. So, these two, two themes then, one, the Fukuyama kind of thesis that capitalism depends upon a continually depleting moral heritage, which it is itself depleting, and we need to bolster it up somehow. The other alternative is we replace, um, we replace uh, the habits, the traditional habits of, uh, 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 of morality as Fukuyama, so we replace those by uh, regulation. And that regulation should be entirely dispassionate and clear-eyed about human motivation and should devise regulation to run with the grain of self-interest rather than against it. And in this context, it's important to realise that there's a kind of school of economists um, uh, called public choice economists, uh, and they include several Nobel Prize winners, particularly James Buchanan, who died recently uh, in the United States, Gordon Tullock and uh, Niskanen. And they took very much as their starting off point a comment uh, made by David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, uh, in his essay on the independency of Parliament. And this is what Hume says. In contriving any system of government, and fixing the several checks and controls of the Constitution, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave and to have no other ends in all his actions than private interests. 
By this interest we must govern him, and by means of it, notwithstanding his insatiable avarice and ambition, co cooperate to the public good. So Hume is saying, we shouldn't assume that people are going to do the right thing as we see it. We've got to assume that people are knaves. They're driven by avarice. They're driven by ambition. They're driven by self-interest. And what we need is clever law and clever regulation that recognises that rather than sort of whistling in the wind about some change in human nature. Um, and one way of putting this, been rather nicely put by Julian Legrand, who's a professor of social policy at the LSE, is that we can distinguish, as it were, between the idea of a knight and the idea of a knave. The knight, the knight in shining armour, if you like, is the person who will do the right thing and in whom we can confide and trust and have confidence in and so forth. The knave is someone who will pursue self-interest. But, but on the Hume view, we must assume, so far as the law and public policy are concerned, that everyone is a knave. And of course, if we then extend markets to more and more areas of our lives, then in those areas too, we must assume that people are knaves. And this is precisely what the public choice uh, people uh, do. Because one of the areas which they study um, is you know, what you might broadly call the public sector. And uh, particularly service provision in the public sector, which of course is under pressure, uh, both under this government and the previous government, to become more and more market-oriented. Now, the issue that they sort of pose, the question they pose, the public choice theorists, those who want to regard individuals as knaves, is this, that in a market, individuals who are operating in the market always operate against the threat of bankruptcy. If I don't meet the needs of the people with whom I'm trading, then I'll go bust. And I, what, what focuses my self-interest on the lives and interests of others is not that I'm compassionate about them or even that I care for them at all, but that without them I'm going to go bust. So what transforms self-interest into the common good in a market is the possibility of bankruptcy. But in the public services, there's no possibility of bankruptcy in that kind of way. There will always be some kind of government arrangement, bailout, um, force mergers and so forth to prevent some large scale service going bankrupt. So if you don't have the same constraint as the threat of bankruptcy in the public sector, why don't public sector workers, as it were, just exploit the fact that they can't go bankrupt because they are self-interested as well? Now, the argument historically has been that The, that people in the public sector don't, by and large, exploit the fact that they can't go bankrupt because their behaviour is constrained by what is called either the public service ethic or the public service ethos. That there is a kind of built-in ethical constraint on what would otherwise be a kind of license to behave in a very exploitative manner because they can't go bankrupt. So remove the constraint of bankruptcy, the only thing that will, as it were, uh, constrain and control uh, the self-interested public sector worker is the supposed ethic, or the, the, the public service ethic. Uh, 
um, or public service ethos, as it's also sometimes called. Now, the public choice argument here is that um, uh, this is just an illusion. There is no such thing as the public service ethic. It's just a fig leaf to cover up different ways of pursuing self-interest. This was an argument made in a very vehement way uh, by Nigel Lawson when he was Chancellor in an essay that he wrote called The New Conservatism. And he said in that essay, drawing on the work of people like Buchanan and Liskanen, that um, public sector workers have not stepped into some kind of different ethical realm. They're like the rest of us. They're self-interested and they will use whatever they can to extend their self-interest. And extending your self-interest in the market, in, in, in the public sector, involves things like trying to improve your, uh, your pay, trying to improve your conditions, trying to extend the size of your uh, responsibilities because that's likely to bring higher status and, and more pay and so on. That there are many, many ways in which in the public sector, even w w without the threat of bankruptcy, individuals will exploit the position that they are in and they will not be prevented from doing so by the public service ethic, that there is nothing to the idea of a public service ethic. Because this was the big argument that, uh, that the public service ethic is a bit like one of Fukuyama's traditional values. I only want to do this job because I want to serve my community or I want to meet the needs of other people and that kind of thing. Well, in the view of the kind of market-oriented public choice theorist, this is just hooey, basically, um, and that these are just, as it were, disguises for the rampant pursuit of self-interest. So, on that view, um, it wouldn't do, I mean, as I said at the end of the, uh, the Fukuyama quotation, what he's suggesting is we've, we should be, first of all, extremely wary of extending markets into more and more areas because the issue of trust is fundamental to markets, but it cannot create its own conditions of trust. So one way of trying to stop the spread of markets is to say, well, it's very important to have a public sector uh, which is is based upon a different set of behavioural assumptions, that people are doing a job because they see it as a vocation or something like that, not as a vehicle for self-interest. Now, the, the problem then... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I should say there's also a kind of subsection of this, uh, the, 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 this argument about the public sector and, um, and, and markets, and it says that in many areas of public ser service provision, uh, there are professional regulatory bodies, like the General Medical Council, the General Nursing Council, and I think the government's thinking about something, some set up like that for uh, teachers as well. But these are professional bodies, and their aim is to as it were, maintain ethical standards within their profession, whether it's medicine or, or whatever it might be. Now, the, the, um, this would fit very much the Fukuyama kind of approach, that what we've got to do is to ensure that there are mechanisms which are non-market mechanisms for preserving as it were, traditional values, like the traditional values of medicine and nursing and so on. And to marketise those will produce very unfortunate consequences in Fukuyama's view because you're, you're turning a market economy into a market society and all non-private relationships would essentially be governed by market relationships and market assumptions about motivation. So, these are the two 
broadly speaking, approaches to this. One, we've got to strengthen the culture that doesn't presuppose self-interest, that does explicitly recognise the need for moral values. And on the other hand, the alternative, the public choice one, is we've got to be clear that that culture is as much motivated by self-interest as any other, and that the project of creating a kind of moral order to regulate human behaviour in that realm is, is just a, a kind of gigantic uh, illusion. Now, one issue that's important here is whether... is whether really a market can, as Fukuyama claims it can't, is, is there any way a market can create and sustain ideas like truth and loyalty and so on and trust, um, which don't fall at the first hurdle to the, to the requirements of self-interest? Well, there is an argument that they can. Um, this is an argument put forward by um, a professor at, uh, at, at Queen Mary College and someone who's in, uh, my, uh, who's in my own college, King's College, um, um, Pennington and uh, Meadowcroft, in a, an Institute of Economic Affairs pamphlet called Saving Social Capital from the Social Democrats. And... Their argument is that, in fact, um, it's perfectly possible to think, and in fact it happens, uh, that markets can create a kind of framework of trust, a framework of loyalty and so forth, and it does this by branding, and it does it by franchise. That you, part of the whole point of branding and franchising is that you learn to trust a particular brand. You won't buy shoes other than, I don't know, Clark shoes, or you won't buy um, underwear anywhere than M&S or whatever it might be. You trust a brand, and you would be likely to trust something that the brand franchises. So, for example... Uh, a good example of this at the moment, because it's extremely profitable, uh, is uh, for universities which have a high reputation to set up campus, campuses overseas because they are franchising. You know, so if you've got a very, you know, one of the top 20 or 30 universities in the world, uh, then you can have confidence in that product and if they are franchising a university in Malaysia or Indonesia or wherever it might be, then you can trust that that university will you know, share at least something with the university that's franchising them. So on this view, we, we, we ought not to be seduced by the kind of cultural pessimism of someone like Fukuyama who thinks that all we can do and it's probably hopeless is to shore up traditional moral values, what we have to do is to think of clever ways of uh, creating brand loyalty and uh, brand franchising. And that this is perfectly compatible with markets and it's perfectly compatible with self-interest. So one of the thing, one of the issues um, uh, that, 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 that remains is, you know, how feasible that is, and will it answer the larger questions about the uh, role of trust in an in in, in an economy? Um, now, there is another issue here which I want just to touch on, and, and perhaps. Uh, sort of finish uh, on, on this point so that unlike last time we have a bit of chance for discussion. I'm sorry I just went on far too long last time. But the, um, uh, uh, and it's this, that uh, 
Going back to the public sector issue, one way of trying to reform the public sector, which is happening before our eyes at the moment, but it's worth looking at the underlying rationale for it, is this that we have to we, we have to sort of think through the difference between the state as a funder of services and the state as a provider of services. Now apart from the most sort of extreme libertarian economists, and most of those are in the United States, uh, most people will, would accept that the state has some responsibility to fund services for its citizens. But does that mean that the state has to provide those services so that teachers, doctors, whoever, is employed by the state and that what they are employed in, hospitals, schools and so forth, have to be provided by the state? Well, no, so the argument goes, because if the state funds services, those services, as will happen now with the health service, those services can be provided by all sorts of institutions. They might be voluntary organisations, they might be churches, uh, they might be uh, not-for-profit uh, companies, they might be ordinary commercial companies, and that there should be a myriad of providers of services, and that in those circumstances we don't have to worry in the public sector about the fact that there is no constraint on behaviour because there is no bankruptcy, because there jolly well would be bankruptcy, because the state, whether national or local, is signing contracts to deliver services with a whole range of different suppliers. Those suppliers will be competing against one another for the contract, and it's perfectly possible to think that some of them will go bust during the time that the contract actually works. So on this view, you've got a kind of neat solution to the problem if you're of that sort of perspective that this, you're not questioning the state as the funder of services but you are questioning the state as the provider of services because if the state contracts with this whole range of uh, private providers then the, con the constraint on behaviour that bankruptcy embodies will be there and that you can actually um, deal with uh, um, exploitative behaviour by um, the fact that companies that don't meet the needs of their clients and patients and so forth will actually go out of business. I mean, it's slightly easier said than done because when, um, when it happens, particularly if you know, you're living in the countryside and there is only one provider and that provider goes bust, then what happens? You know, does the state step in? And if so, isn't that a form of moral hazard because you will always assume, even though it seems to be like a market system, that the state will pick up the tab? Um, but anyway, uh, that, that, that's the sort of theory of it, that, that you can constrain behaviour by bankruptcy. We don't have to make any special assumptions that people in the public sector are guided by some higher, sorry, some higher moral values, like the public service ethic, or seeing their profession as a vocation. We can just see them as self-interested like everybody else, and subject to uh, the possibility of bankruptcy in the way that I've uh, suggested. Now, this is, as I say, happening. It's partly happening in the schools. It's partly happening uh, in, the, uh, in the health service because any sort of willing provider uh, can be considered for uh, providing um, health care uh, and, and making contracts uh, with, uh, with those who have the, um, 
the, the resources to do that. But what you will end up with, and this is going back in a sense to the Lionel Jospin uh, sort of um, position, um, it, it, I mean, he was worried about the idea of a, a market economy transforming society into a market society. But there's, there's a, a very specific issue here as well that I started off by saying how far contract depends upon some kind of framework of values that has to be present in order for contract not to fall victim to self-interest. Um, and yet, what we will end up with, and I mean, there may be merit in this, but what we will end up with is what you might call a contracting state. I don't mean contracting in the sense of narrowing, but in that, this context, I mean the state will essentially contract for services, and that contracting process will be a competitive one. So right at the heart of government in this new dispensation is the relationship of contract between the funder and a range of potential providers. And the issue then is how far, uh, given what we started this uh, talk with issues about contract, how far what needs to be in the contract or what the contract has to presuppose can in fact be put in the contract. Because, uh, you know, just going back to Durkheim's uh, rather pithy phrase that not everything in the contract is contractual. Um, and the issue of trust isn't somehow dissipated by this. Because, I mean, as, uh, uh, no doubt many of you are involved in contracts of signing and uh, one thing or another like that. Uh, but the to provide a complex service through a contract, whether it's putting up a new building or providing dentistry or whatever it might be in a geographical area, is a very complex business and it can't all be put in the contract because you don't know what everything that needs to be thought about. You know, there, is, there, are, there are unknown unknowns as well as known unknowns to coin a phrase and they can't all be put in the contract. There has to be a degree of negotiation and give and take as the contract goes forward because it can't all be in the legal document, particularly with these complex services. And if that's so, that process of give and take of further negotiation of we didn't think it would work out like this, wouldn't it be better if we could renegotiate this bit or that bit? All of that presupposes trust as does the contract itself. So I don't think this is a way of getting around the idea of trust because in a sense, in a contractual state, trust would be absolutely central uh, to it. Uh, and of course, this relates to the churches particularly uh, in the sense that both in terms of schools um, and as the health service changes, uh, possibly health care or more likely social care, the churches, along with other voluntary organisations, will become central to this contracting culture. So it's very important that people uh, understand, and I'm not suggesting I've done it in these lectures, but you know, that the, the, there are a lot of complex moral issues about choice, about social justice, about the rights and duties of property, and so on, including this pervasive issue of trust, which I've tried to make out uh, the, the case over uh, today. But I don't myself feel uh, that the Pennington and um, Meadowcroft approach of saying, well, markets can create sufficient uh, social capital, as it's usually called, uh, to avoid the problems which Fukuyama poses. That, that, that that can in fact be done. I mean, if it can, fine, there's no problem. But if it can't be done, there is a very big problem about how you do replenish the moral heritage on which capitalism has historically drawn. Okay, I, well, sorry, I've gone on too long again. I have to... Uh...